Welcome to another week of the Kim 1211 Lab here in North Georgia. Uh, this week we're going to be doing something a little bit different. Uh, it's almost going to feel a little bit more like lecture kind of while you're in lab, uh, mainly because what we're going to be taking a look at is Lewis dot structures and Vesper geometries. Uh, and kind of just getting used to drawing Lewis structures, uh, getting used to seeing some of our Vesper geometry shapes. Uh, and we do even have some model kits if you want to play with them to help with some of the different geometries to kind of try and help see things visually. Uh, because uh, this particular topic, more than maybe almost any other in general chemistry, or at least up there is one of probably the most important, uh, you're going to see this topic pop up again in 1212. Uh, you're going to see Lewis dot structures and Vesper geometries and kind of how they tie into polarity and other things pop up in organic chemistry if you go on to take organic. Uh, and really just kind of almost any chemistry class you go on beyond that even, like biochemistry or inorganic, like other classes, you're still going to see uh, this type of material. So it's definitely one of the more important things uh, you're going to see in 1211, uh, which is why we spend a decent amount of time in lab as well as in lecture kind of covering some of these topics. Um, because it is really, really critical to kind of just fundamental understanding uh, for us to be able to talk about molecules and kind of uh, in order to be able to predict how molecules are going to behave, we have to understand what their structures look like and what their geometries look like, because that's then going to dictate a lot about their properties down the road, particularly as you get into 1212, the start of that course. So in terms of what Lewis dot structures are, so a Lewis dot structure uh, is basically just kind of a, a shorthand version of trying to display all of the valence electrons uh, in a molecule and show basically where they are or how they're involved in bonding. Now, some general things uh, in terms of how these structures are typically formatted. Uh, you're typically going to see dots used to represent electrons. And if you see a pair, and they're typically always going to show up as a pair of dots in all of these structures that we see uh, to represent a lone pair of electrons. Uh, and additionally, you'll typically see a, a bond or just a line connecting two atoms. Uh, every, every line that you see kind of connecting two atoms is going to involve two electrons making a single bond. Uh, if you have two lines connecting two atoms, that would actually then be a double bond, and there's going to be two electrons per bond between those two atoms. Uh, and so you'd actually see four electrons in a double bond, and if we had a triple bond, we could see six. Uh, we won't really see higher than triple bond at any point for general chemistry, uh, for just kind of our general examples. Uh, but to give you kind of like a, a visual look at kind of what these things typically look like, uh, typically the way we do things, uh, when we have a, we're going to use just the symbols for our individual atoms, and what we do is we kind of separate our electrons into quadrants. Right, so you see here it's kind of four quadrants where we have pairs and three of them, which is an individual fluorine atom. And fluorine, if you look at the periodic table, should have seven valence electrons. Really, to, and, and to find your valence electrons, if you just start at the very left of the periodic table, you're just kind of counting columns on your way across. Uh, and if you're looking at something that's going to be doing covalent bonding, like our nonmetals in the P block, kind of just skip the D block uh, in terms of your counting. So basically, like in, you'd have like group one, group two, kind of skip to group 13, 14, 15, and so on. So like, Group 15, it's going to have five valence electrons. Uh, group 17, like fluorine, it's going to have seven valence electrons. Um, so that's why we see the seven dots here. Right? You see three pairs and then a lone one. And usually what happens is if an individual atom has a lone electron like this, that's where they're likely to form a covalent bond. Uh, there's a general trend uh, that almost all of our atoms follow uh, and when they try to make molecules is they like to have eight electrons total around them. And so in the case of fluorine, if it's already got seven, it wants to gain one more. And the way it can do that is by actually taking the one electron that it has here that's kind of unpaired and actually sharing it with kind of an unpaired electron on something else uh, to actually form some sort of covalent bond. Right? And so you see like here, if we draw these two atoms now near each other, these two kind of individual electrons here now can almost form a pair here that's actually going to be a bonding pair of electrons. Uh, and so rather than seeing this as the general rotation, you'll probably see for the Lewis structures themselves as we start drawing them, you'll have a line then connecting these two flu fluorines, uh, excuse me, that will then represent this lone pair, or, sorry, not this lone pair, that, the bonding pair of electrons that are there. Now, in terms of drawing Lewis structures themselves, uh, the nice thing about these uh, is that it's really systematic. There's kind of a, a pretty straightforward list of rules you basically follow, and as long as you follow those same steps every time, you should get to the correct answer every time. Uh, there's no reason not to really be able to kind of just follow the steps. Uh, and so we'll go through kind of what the outline of those steps are, and pretty much no matter who you have for lecture or, or lab, pretty much all go through this the same way. Uh, these first two steps, you can do them kind of in any order, so I don't feel like you have to do it this uh, valence electrons first and skeletal structure second. Uh, order's not super important, but these are kind of the first two things you pretty much always do. Uh, I like to usually start with counting just the total number of valence electrons your compound's going to have. Uh, and so 
what in each atom you're going to look at for each atom how many valence electrons does each atom have and then just add up your total number of valence electrons for all the atoms in that molecule second drawing a skeletal structure for a compound so how we do this and i don't outline this super in depth here uh, right now on the slide but how you draw a skeletal structure is you're actually going to pick one central atom and kind of attach everything to it with a single bond and the way you pick a central atom is it's usually going to be the least electronegative non-hydrogen element which sounds really complicated but when you have a formula in front of you it's actually really easy the formulas that you typically see for like just a, a chemical formula are pretty much always written with the least electronegative elements first working their way towards the most electronegative elements so since the least electronegative atoms are listed first anyway in the formula typically your central atom is just the first element in the formula with the only exception of that really being hydrogen if hydrogen's first Hydrogen actually can't be the central atom, and we'll see kind of a reason for that in, uh, in a moment. Uh, but hydrogen can't be the central element, so usually then it's the one after the hydrogen in that chemical formula uh, that's going to be your central atom for your structure. Now, once you draw that skeletal structure with all of those single bonds, we're going to fill the outer octets on any of the outer atoms in the molecule. And I'll be going through a full example, a couple of actually full examples of this uh, once I get through these individual steps that will hopefully outline what I mean by each of them uh, a little bit better visually as well. Uh, but filling all the terminal octets basically means we're going to add three lone pairs to all the outer atoms. And again, the only exception probably in this step would be hydrogen. Hydrogen actually won't fill an octet uh, because it turns out that octet, that kind of magic number of eight, um, that's how many electrons it takes to fill S and P orbitals on an atom. But hydrogen only has an S orbital, so or at least only has an S orbital in the first energy level where its uh, electrons normally would be. So it only hydrogen only wants to pretty much make one bond, and that's pretty much all you'll ever see hydrogen do. Uh, which is why up here in that second step we say non-hydrogen elements for the central atom. Uh, hydrogen is never going to be in the middle because it can only make one bond. We can't make more than that to it. Now, once we have all of our outer octets filled, if we do have any electrons left, we're going to put them on the central atom as a lone pair. And this is where that first step where we counted our total number of valence electrons. Basically, once we know how many electrons we have to work with, and now once we get past step three and we've used all of our, or put all of our terminal octets on our outer atoms, what we're going to do is figure out how many electrons are left at that point in time. Uh, and if there are any left, they always go just on the central atom as a lone pair. Extra electrons at the end for your total count will never make multiple bonds. That is not how they work. They make lone pairs on the central atom every single time. Um, and that's actually probably one of the most missed things I see kind of out of these steps uh, when people are usually going through them. Now, step five, the next thing then is just to check your central atom to make sure it has one of these octets. So we want the central atom to have eight electrons around it. And if it doesn't have eight, if it's less than that, what we want to do is then actually look, is there another atom around it that has a bunch of lone pairs that it might be able to make a double bond to by taking one of the lone pairs off the outer atom? to make a double bond to then get an octet to the central atom. And I'll show an example of kind of how this works uh, also in just a moment. And then the very last thing that I tell people uh, that you should probably just get in a habit of doing also, uh, just as good kind of practice, uh, is once you think you have the best structure for everything and everything's got an octet, check to make sure there's no resonance and no formal charge, or at least you have minimized formal charge uh, if you have to have formal charge. Uh, and so I'm going to be explaining kind of both of these as we go through things. I'm going to start with formal charge. I'm actually going to talk a little bit about it first. Then we'll look at some sample structures. And in one of them, I'll use an example to kind of show what, I, what resonance actually is so that you kind of know what to look for or what, what really is resonance. So formal charge real quick uh, before we get to our examples. Uh, formal charge really is kind of the charge an atom thinks it has based on the structure that it's in. Uh, and so we can actually just calculate it mathematically. Uh, and we do this for individual atoms. What you're going to do is for each atom in the structure, you're going to take its number of valence electrons minus the total number of bonds that individual atom is making minus the total electrons that are in lone pairs. Now, sometimes this middle one here, you will sometimes see some people label this as one half the number of bonding electrons, uh, just so that it's number of electrons total everywhere. I usually just like to think of this as number of bonds because that's really what one half the bonding electrons are. Each bond has two electrons, so just the number of bonds is one half the number of bonding electrons, just so if you, if you see that written diff differently anywhere else. Um, but applying this to show kind of just a, a, kind of a, a quick example, let's say you have an oxygen that has two bonds and two lone pairs, which is a total then of four electrons in those lone pairs uh, in terms of finding its formal charge. Oxygen, if you look at the periodic table, has six valence electrons normally. 
it's making two bonds, so minus two, and then we're going to minus four electrons for those two lone pairs. Right? We're counting all the electrons in the lone pairs, and that's going to be a formal charge of zero. And that's really the goal, or what we hope to see for as many formal charges as possible in a molecule, is we want the formal charge to be zero on as many atoms as we can have it on basically throughout the molecule. Uh, the lower the formal charges in terms of like kind of closer to zero all the formal charges are, the better and the more stable our overall structure is typically going to be. Uh, now, one couple things you will see with formal charge, all the formal charges in a molecule have to match, if you add them together, it has to match the overall molecule's charge. So if you do have a polyatomic ion that has an overall charge, something like nitrate, you will have to have formal charges somewhere in the structure. And the sum of all of them will add up to negative one. Um, so that is kind of something to keep in mind. Our goal is usually to have as many zero formal charges as possible, but there's going to be cases where you can't do that. If you have an ion, you are going to have to have a negative charge or a positive charge somewhere, depending on what the charge of your polyatomic ion is. <clears throat> but we do always want to minimize formal charge when we can. Uh, and this does pop up a few times here and there. It particularly pops up with expanded octets that I'll touch on at the very end here. Uh, but if we have in a way to, or basically if we have a way to minimize formal charge, we pretty much will always do it if it's an option. And again, I'll, I'll show an example where this does come up here in just a bit. Uh, and in some cases, I'm not going to show one here in the slides, but you will see one uh, this week kind of in the lab. Uh, you can also use formal charge to differentiate between two different Lewis structures that might both obey kind of the general octet rule, but are different structures. And you can actually differentiate them by formal charge and pick which one is actually better. Uh, carbon dioxide is probably one of the best examples we'll see typically see for kind of showing that. All right, so examples. I think this is where all this all these pieces that I've kind of described and outlined really start to come together and hopefully make a little bit more sense. So we're going to take a look at carbon tetrachloride, CCL4. So first step from kind of the outline steps a few slides ago, uh, we said we want to figure out how many total valence electrons we have. Well, carbon, if we look at the periodic table, has four valence electrons. Each chlorine has seven. We have four chlorines. So if we take four times seven, that's 28 electrons from the four chlorines. Four more from the carbon, we have 32 total. All right, so we have 32 electrons we're going to put in our structure. Step two, we want to draw a skeletal structure. And so for the skeletal structure, we're just going to look at this chemical formula, and we're going to look, what is the first element that's listed? That is pretty much always your least electronegative atom. That's the one that's going to go in the center. So carbon is going to be our central atom in this structure. All of the chlorines are going to be bound to that carbon. For any molecule that is not going to have just a single central atom, we will usually tell you something that, hey, this is a chain-like structure. Uh, otherwise, kind of assume there's just one central atom. Uh, maybe the only time that wouldn't be the case, depending on kind of who you have for lecture, uh, there can be organic molecules, which, and what I mean by organic is things that have lots of different carbons in them. If there's a lot of carbons, those carbons usually will form like a carbon chain. And so they'll be kind of like strung together as carbon atoms, like all linked to each other, rather than having just one central atom. We won't see a lot of those in 1211 in particular. We might see them a little bit more in 1212. Uh, especially kind of early in 12-12 as we do some things with intermolecular forces. Uh, but for the most part, everything we draw Lewis structures for right now, pretty much all of it's going to have one central atom with everything attached to it. So skeletal structure here for carbon tetrachloride, putting carbon in the middle, single bonds to everything. That's kind of our starting point. All right, step three is going to be adding octets to everything. So that means for all of our chlorides, we're basically adding three lone pairs of electrons so that now each chlorine, in terms of how we count electrons, each chlorine has six total electrons from lone pairs, and each bond counts as two more electrons to matching what I said is that kind of octet rule or that preference for all atoms to always have eight electrons. So chlorine here would have two, four, six, eight, and all of these chlorines look identical and that they have one bond and three lone pairs, so all of them have eight electrons. So that's good. So there's our octets on all the outer atoms. Step four is usually checking the central atom to make sure uh, it's gonna have an octet and also just to make sure that we don't have any leftover electrons we have to put on that central atom. So step four, if we look here, we have 32 total electrons that were in our structure. If we count all the electrons currently in this structure here from step three, we have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight around this chlorine. We have eight more around this one, eight more here, eight more here, eight times four is 32. So we actually use all of our electrons to get to this point, which means carbon gets no lone pairs. But when we look at carbon structure, if it's got four bonds, there's two electrons in each of those bonds, so that's already a total of eight electrons around the carbon. So carbon is already happy in this structure. So carbon looks good. We don't have to do anything to it. We don't need to make any multiple bonds. 
All of our outer atoms have all of their octets. Everything looks good. The only last thing we'll check for is formal charge and resonance. And again, resonance we'll, we'll see in a minute for what that looks like. But for formal charge, if we were to calculate for carbon, carbon had four valence electrons to start with as four bonds. So it'd be four minus four minus zero electrons and lone pairs is zero. And ideally, like I said before, the more zero formal charges, the better. And if we have a neutral molecule, hopefully it's all zero formal charges. Every now and then maybe that can't happen, but as much as we can get that to happen, we would like it to. So in this case, we're looking at the chlorines then too. If the whole molecule is neutral, chlorines should also have zero formal charge. And if we checked it quick for them, they each have seven valence electrons to start, minus one bond, minus one, two, three, four, five, six electrons. Seven minus one minus six is zero. So the chlorines also have zero formal charge. So no formal charge in any of the atoms here. This is pretty much the best structure we can have then for a carbon tetrachloride. So I'm going to show kind of again just the process for a couple more examples. Right, we're going to look at one that does have a multiple bond. So we're looking at CH2O. This compound's called formaldehyde. Uh, our first step, counting our electrons. Carbon has four. Each hydrogen has one. So that's why I see the two times one plus six from oxygen. It's going to give us 12 total. And then for our skeletal structure, right, carbon is the first element listed. So we're going to attach everything to that carbon. Now, for the Lewis structures, um, check with your lecture professor just probably to make sure. Uh, usually for the Lewis structure, I'm not very picky personally on whether you draw things properly for the actual shape of the molecule at all. Uh, this is not how this molecule will actually end up looking in three dimensions, just so that people kind of realize that. We will talk about geometries in a moment. Uh, but for just the Lewis structure, I don't really care what the geometry looks like. I just want to get the bonds and lone pairs right. Because once you have that part right, then we can talk about Vesper to figure out the geometry portion of things. All right, so skeletal structure, we have that, right? Carbon in the middle, everything attached to it, a single bond. Step three is filling all the outer octets. But realize here that's only going to be oxygen, right? Because hydrogen, since it doesn't really have any p orbitals in its main energy level, uh, we can't put more than just two electrons on it. So hydrogen only wants two electrons. Well, each bond has two electrons, so hydrogen just makes one bond, and that's, that's it. Hydrogen won't do anything else. Uh, oxygen, in this case, we put all of our six, uh, sorry, all six electrons around it to go with the two electrons in the bond, so that has eight. So there, that gets oxygen's octet. And now, once that outer octet's filled, we check to see how many electrons we started with versus how many are in our structure. So around oxygen, we said we have eight. There's two more in this bond is 10, two more in this bond is 12. So we've used all of our electrons. And so again, that means there's no lone pair that we can put to the carbon. But when we look at the carbon this time, there's no lone pairs that we can add to it, but the carbon doesn't have its octet yet, right? Carbon has two electrons in each of the three bonds that are made to it, but that's only a total of six. So it doesn't have that octet yet. So the way we fix that is by actually taking one of the lone pairs on the oxygen, the outer atom, and basically taking that lone pair and taking those two electrons and making a second bond to the central atom. Uh, and hopefully this visual kind of shows a little bit what's going on. Imagine taking one of the lone pairs in our outer atom to make a second bond to the carbon. And that's how we get multiple bonds or why we get multiple bonds in some structures is that without making those multiple bonds, we can't get that octet on that central atom. And so here we end up with two lone pairs still left on the oxygen. And again, depending on who you have for lecture, maybe they want the lone pairs shown opposite of each other just to spread them out. That's fine. I just wanted to show kind of the image of the lone pairs really kind of coming down to make the double bond here uh, for this particular image. Now, once that double bond is made, we can again check things for formal charge and resonance, things like that. So if we're looking here at this molecule, carbon has four valence electrons normally, has four total bonds that it's made, right? One, two, three for the double bond and then four. So four minus four, no lone pairs, so zero formal charge, that's good. And one of the neat things about formal charge, one of the nice things I think is it's really pattern based. So if carbon with four bonds is a zero formal charge once, any other time you see carbon making four bonds, its formal charge is zero every time. Uh, and so you kind of get used to some patterns that certain atoms normally like to have. So carbon in just about every molecule you ever see it in, especially for general chemistry, will probably just have four bonds. That's its most stable configuration. Oxygen, if we're looking at oxygen, oxygen more often than not is going to have two total bonds and two lone pairs because that's what's going to give it a zero formal charge. Right? If it has six valence electrons normally, minus two bonds, minus four electrons and lone pairs, that's the zero formal charge for oxygen. If you see oxygen having more than two bonds or less than two bonds, that means it is going to have an, a formal charge to it. 
Um, and so there, there's kind of these nice pattern things with formal charge that do start to pop up uh, as you go through and do more examples. Uh, that does help make things kind of easier as you go for looking for those formal charges. Uh, and again, in this one, we haven't talked about resonance, but there is no resonance to the structure. Uh, this is, uh, excuse me, this is our best Lewis structure then for the formaldehyde, the CH2O. All right, one more example of kind of just drawing the structure, and this time we will have what we call resonance, and so I can show kind of what it looks like uh, when it happens. So we're going to draw the Lewis structure for ozone, which is O3. First step, again, just how many electrons do we have to work with? Each oxygen has six. We have three oxygens, so 18 total that we're going to work with. For this one, structure-wise, it doesn't matter which of the three oxygens you pick because they're all the same element. We're going to have one oxygen as the central atom and the other two bound to that oxygen. Right? And so there's our kind of general skeletal structure, one central atom, two oxygens on the outsides. We can fill our octets on the outer atoms. Right? So there's filling the octet on the left one and on the right one. It takes six electrons or three lone pairs each. And now when we look here at this structure currently, we have really have eight electrons around each of the two outer oxygens, so that's 16 total. We started with 18, so there are two electrons left over this time. And remember, leftover electrons will always be a lone pair in the central atom. So that means we get a lone pair on the central oxygen here. All right, so there's all the electrons we have to work with. But again, if we look at our central atom, this oxygen only has two, four, six electrons total around it. So that means we're going to have to add two more electrons somehow. And we're going to do it the same way we did for formaldehyde or previous example. We're going to take a lone pair off of one of these oxygens to make a double bond. And so we can do that here. We take a lone pair off, make a double bond to this other oxygen. And that'll now give us an octet on our central atom. And by, again, taking that lone pair off of one of the outer ones and making the double bond, this one, outer one still has an octet. But this is where we now get into this idea of resonance. So when we're looking at this structure right now, I made the double bond to the left oxygen, but I also could have made the double bond to the right oxygen. Right? I don't really have a way to know which oxygen I'm supposed to make that double bond to. Um, and this is where resonance really comes in. So when we're trying to figure out, you know, should I have a double bond on the left or the right? Well, the reality is those are basically the same structure, right? They don't really look all that different as far as which side the double bond's on. I still end up with one oxygen with a double bond, one with a single bond. And in fact, if we look at these two structures down here, if we look at formal charges, here I have one oxygen that has two lone pairs and two bonds, which a slide a couple slides ago we said that's what oxygen normally wants to have, so that's a zero formal charge. The central oxygen, though, if we're looking at it, has three bonds and one lone pair. So 6 minus 3 minus 2 is actually a positive one formal charge on the central oxygen. And then here the outer oxygen that's making the single bond, we'd have 6 minus uh, 1 bond minus 6 electrons and lone pairs is negative 1. So we actually have a positive and negative 1 formal charge here. This version of the structure also has a positive and negative 1 formal charge. Right? Positive 1 still in the center, this time the negative 1 on the left oxygen, 0 over on the right. Formal charges though overall, we have one atom at 0, one at positive 1, one at negative 1. Over here, also one positive one, one negative one, and one zero. So formal charge-wise, these two are basically the same. Neither one is better than the other. This is then what we call resonance. So we basically have two ways to draw kind of the same structure in terms of where we put the double bond. So whenever we have a double bond that could go in multiple possible locations and be equal, we consider that molecule to have resonance. Uh, and what we kind of consider resonance to be is that when we look at an individual molecule of ozone, we're actually never going to see just one, one that's a double bond and one that's a single bond. We'll actually see both sides kind of almost be an average to where uh, we often will sometimes talk about resonance hybrids and the fact that when we, instead of drawing both resonance forms, you may every now and then actually see a hybrid structure that's drawn like this where anytime you do see a dashed line like this in any structures in the future, this basically means that this bond between these two oxygens, since there's already one single line and then a dashed line, it's stronger than a single bond but weaker than a double bond. It's kind of somewhere between. Now, for this lab, and probably for any Lewis structure you have to draw in your lectures, we want to see the resonance structures like this. Right? So we basically want you to draw all the different possible ways of you being able to move the double bond around from one spot to another. Uh, and we separate them with double-sided arrows. That's kind of the typical symbol that we'll use to show that these are resonance forms of one another. So this is what we do want you to show in the lab itself when you go to turn things in in a couple weeks. Uh, this, though, I just want people to be aware of kind of just the general notation. If you see dashed lines, that's really indicative that there's resonance going on there. And that means that these bonds are basically more than a single bond, but less than a double. All right. Now, 
Last part before I get into looking at shapes of molecules, uh, general octet rule kind of exceptions. Uh, it is possible that in some cases, some elements don't like to have a full octet. Uh, the only elements we really ever see this for are group 13, particularly boron, sometimes aluminum, uh, and also then hydrogen. So hydrogen, I think we've already talked about. Hydrogen only wants two electrons because it only has an S orbital, so it's only going to take two electrons because that's all it takes to fill just its S orbital. Uh, group 13 elements like boron and aluminum, since they only have three valence electrons normally, they're actually usually okay with just six electrons from three bonds and no lone pairs because that will actually keep them at a zero formal charge. So that's actually something that's pretty common for those elements. Uh, and in some cases, they will actually, especially in the case of boron, do some very strange bonding uh, that we tend not to talk about in general chemistry because their bonding is extremely unique. Uh, in fact, boron kind of has almost its own entire field of chemistry uh, because the fact that it, it wants to try and keep zero formal charge when possible, it gives rise to all, all sorts of crazy new types of bonding that you don't normally see at other elements. Uh, but like I said, not, not something we're going to concern ourselves really with in this class. Now, on the other end of the spectrum, we can also have expanded octets. So some atoms are able to have more than eight electrons. And the only requirement really for this is that elements need to be in the third row or lower in the periodic table. And this does two things. Uh, one, if we're in the third row of the periodic table, the atoms are usually a little bit bigger. So it's easier to fit more things around them. And probably more importantly, you have just more orbitals. Uh, if you're in the third row of the periodic table, remember kind of quantum number wise from a couple chapters ago, uh, that means you actually have access to d orbitals if you're at the n equals three energy level. And if you have d orbitals, that means you now have extra electrons that you can't, or actually sorry, extra orbitals that you can put more electrons into. Because eight, that octet that everything wants is the magic number for filling s and p orbitals. So to go over eight, that means we all need other orbitals that we can access. And most of the time, we can think of those as kind of being empty d orbitals. It's kind of our, our generic way that we usually talk about that. All right, so last part of what we're going to go over this week, I think that covers most of the kind of general reduction of Lewis structures. Uh, in, lect or in lab this week, you'll kind of see a lot more examples. So your instructors kind of walk you through these steps again, uh, just to make sure you're kind of comfortable doing so. Uh, but the other thing we're going to see is also going to look at shapes of molecules once we have the Lewis structure. And so to look at shapes, we're going to use what we call VSEPR, or V-S-E-P-R, uh, which is just an acronym that stands for val Valent Shell Electron Pair Repulsion. And really, it's a, a, really just a really fancy way of saying that electrons repel each other. And so all of the structures that we see are just the bonds and lone pairs around atoms trying to spread out as much as possible. And that's why we get the shapes that we see. Uh, so kind of real shorthand version of this, electrons repel each other, so that's where we get all of our shapes. Um, it's really what Vesper takes a look at. Uh, and when you're thinking about what shape something's gonna have, we're usually focusing on our central atom, and we're trying to figure out how many areas or regions of space around that central atom are gonna contain electrons that are trying to spread out. And typically the way we find that's really just looking at how many lone pairs does it have, and how many bound atoms, or how many atoms are attached to the central atom. Those are kind of the two two factors that we're typically going to look at. And we'll use kind of some of that information to help us then find what we call these geometries. So there's two types of geometries that VSEPR helps us predict. Uh, we have what we call electron geometries and molecular geometries. So for an electron geometry, these, these are probably the more important ones in particular, these starting out. These are the general starting shapes of everything. So everything is going to start from one of kind of the five basic uh, electron geometries that we're going to introduce. Uh, and this is going to take into account for the electron geometry, it's the shape of all of the bound atoms and all of the lone pairs, or really just all the electrons total around a central atom. Molecular geometries are actually going to be kind of a, a subset of an electron geometry, where once you know your electron geometry kind of starting shape, your molecular geometry is then going to look at what shape do just the atoms look like they make based on the electron geometry you start with. So any molecule that has lone pairs on the central atom, you're going to get a molecular geometry that's going to look a little bit different than your overall electron geometry. And, I'll, and I think this will make a little more sense when I show some images here uh, in a second on kind of some of the next slides to go with this. Uh, but in general, we're always going to look for this electron geometry first. And then once we know our general starting shape that accounts for all of our electrons in a structure, then we can look at, well, what does the molecule itself look like in terms of just the atoms? Uh, because the lone pairs might be there and taking up space, but there's no atom there. So visually, if we're just looking at the atoms, we kind of want to describe what that shape looks like. Uh, and that's what our molecular geometry is. <laughs> and again, no lone pairs in the central atom. We will actually see these two be the same all the time. 
Right, now, how do we determine electron geometries? Uh, electron in particular is kind of the, the starting point. So first start step is really just going to be drawing the Lewis structure. If you don't have the correct Lewis structure, you're not going to get the right geometry. Um, that's unfortunately just kind of how it's going to work, um, which is why we do the Lewis structure part here first. Now, Vesper and looking at geometry is kind of the next step. Uh, once you have the correct Lewis structure, the next thing you're going to do is count the total number of areas where electrons can be found around a central atom. Uh, and you'll hear this referred to as different terms depending on what book you look at, depending on what teacher you have. Uh, the most common phrases that people use, I usually call them electron groups. Uh, I think our textbook calls them charge clouds. Uh, if you have like Dr. Herbert or Mr. Uh, uh, Mr. Kruger, they, used to, they usually like the term just the number of sites. It's like how many things are really around a central atom. And that's really what you're counting. Like how many lone pairs and how many atoms are attached to a particular single at central atom. Uh, that's what you're really trying to count here. So number of charge clouds or electron groups, it's the number of lone pairs. So every pair of electrons, like two electrons, is one lone pair. And the number of bonded atoms. Note this is the number of bonded atoms, not bonds. So for instance, if we're looking at the example of CO2, this is the Lewis structure for carbon dioxide. It's got two double bonds, but in terms of how many charge clouds or electron groups this thing has, it only has two. It's bound to two atoms and it has zero lone pairs. So this thing has two things around it. And so it's that two that we're counting that will then help us find our electron geometry. And I'm gonna show how that works out of some, some tables here in just a second. Uh, but that'll be kind of our general process. If there was a lone pair here, and let's say there was only like one double bond, like the double bond or single bond doesn't even matter. If there was a lone pair, we'd have two bound atoms and a lone pair. Now there's three things around that carbon. Um, and so it's really just we're counting how many things are around that central atom. And that's going to dictate kind of our starting what we call electron geometry. And so this is a chart that comes out of kind of the, it's a slightly older edition of the same textbook we have now. But if we're looking at this chart, trying to find kind of what are, uh, what is the geometry of a molecule? We see some different examples. For carbon dioxide that we had up a second ago, we said there's two areas of electrons around the carbon, right? just the two double bonds. And so two things around the central atom. Our overall geometry is going to be linear for both the electron, and, excuse me, the electron and the molecular geometry. For all of our other kind of starting possible shapes, if there's more than two things around an atom, the first geometry you see in this table for like a set, basically as far as the number of here, the reference is charge clouds. Again, just the number of sites really around a central atom. So like here we see formaldehyde structure that we drew the Lewis structure for a few minutes ago. This carbon has three atoms around it and no lone pairs. So if that's three things around the carbon, so that's three charged clouds. With no lone pairs, this first top geometry, that's the electron geometry of this thing, trigonal planar. And for this particular molecule, the molecular geometry is also trigonal planar because there are no lone pairs. This molecule here, SO2, sulfur dioxide, here we have two bound oxygens and a lone pair for three things around this sulfur. But because one of those three things is a lone pair, we notice the shape of this molecule is not going to look trigonal planar if we're looking at only the atoms. Right? If we're just looking at these three atoms, they actually make kind of a bent shape. And in fact, we will often call this bent, one, I'm sorry, in this case 120, uh, to specify that it's coming from this trigonal planar starting geometry. Uh, and you can kind of keep applying the same thing. There's other geometry. So, but to point out just the base electron geometries, if there's two things around an atom, your starting electron geometry is linear. If there's three things around it, it's going to be trigonal planar. If there's four, it's going to be tetrahedral. And then on the next slide, I have the others. If there's five, the electron geometry is this trigonal bipyramidal up here. And you might hear some people abbreviate this as TBP. I would definitely ask any lecture and lab professors before using that abbreviation ever, but that is something that's kind of common between some of the faculty. Uh, and then for if there's six things around a central atom, like here we have six fluorines around one sulfur, no lone pairs, that's when we get octahedral for the electron geometry, which it's weird that it says octa even though it's six, but the octahedral refers to the overall shape being made looking like an octahedron is why it's called that. And then for your molecular geometries, when you look at a molecule, you're kind of looking at, all right, we found how many total things are around it. That gets us the starting shape. Then we want to figure out how many lone pairs are there. So here we have SF4 had four bound atoms, one lone pair. It's five total things around it for a trigonal bipyramidal starting electron geometry. But because it has this one lone pair, if we only look at these atoms in terms of, sorry, if we only look at these atoms right here in terms of our shape, if we tilt it 90 degrees and kind of from where it's shown right now, it looks kind of like a teeter-totter or a seesaw. 
and that's then what we call seesaw for that molecular geometry. Uh, and so what you'll be doing in the lab, uh, your lab instructors will be going over some of these ge geometries with you in terms of kind of where they come from and how to describe the molecular and the uh, electron geometries or how to find your electron and molecular geometries. Uh, but that's really what lab will be this week, kind of reviewing how to do, draw a Lewis structure and then just doing a bunch of examples of it. Uh, and in the same, reviewing kind of some things with VSEPR and electron and molecular geometries and using your Lewis structures that you've drawn to then find geometries for those molecules. Um, that's kind of the main goal of this week's lab. And then next week, we're going to kind of continue down this road, uh, except instead of looking at just the Lewis structures and the Vesper uh, shapes, uh, then we're going to add some things to this and talk about the types of bonding, uh, and things like hybridization and polarity, uh, and other things that we can figure out once we know more about Lewis structures and just general shapes. Right? And so that's all I have for this week. Uh, if anyone has any questions, you can always, like I said, feel free to email me or your other lab professors. I uh, hope everyone has a good week, and we'll see you next time.